<laughs> I was just letting them grill me in science questions. Actually, so what is your background? I am a high school science teacher, okay. um, and I, uh, you know, I love comic books, and I'm trying to make a chemistry comic book to teach my students how to. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, which I've given all of you a copy of, um, and I will be giving you a. Oh, copy please, thank also. you. Excellent. Um, me and. This gentleman here, who hey, wants to introduce himself. This is uh, uh, Josh Reynolds. He is the artist. Um, hey, Josh. On that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're, we're trying to make, you know, do some smart comics. What is the what's the greatest challenge for you to turn something that is basically academic into something that is visually oriented and has a narrative to it? Um, so you know, most of my kids don't want to read a textbook, right. uh, as most kids don't. And but I want them to understand the real world concepts of how chemistry applies to everything. Yeah. And so um, you know, there's lots of really rich stories. You know, like every every metal is pretty, or every element is pretty much toxic or harmful to you, and to, to some extent, to some degree. So uh, I just try to find stories, create a create a compelling narrative for yeah. them to <clears throat> uh, enjoy the characters, cool. and then sort of subconsciously learn the science as they go through it. That's good. that's really smart. So you can sort of self learn them. Yeah. And try. Okay. I'm trying, yeah. Cool. That's the goal. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, but you, you put a lot of science in comics. <laughs> I do put a lot of science in comics. I, I was a physics minor in, in, in college. That was a long time ago and they had discovered for the two elements. That's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the rest of them are pretty wacky. Exactly. But I was always I was always a science kid. I was never a mythology kid. I have a huge respect for mythology and I have a huge respect for fantasy novels and so forth and so on. But it is the science stuff that I always gravitated to in comics and in fiction and in my interests. And so, um, like I said, a physics minor uh, and still read tons of, of scientific material every day just because they're, you're finding out new ways of doing things and, and seeing, like, especially writing with Marvel first writing for characters like Tony Stark and so forth, you, you know, you see a story like, like, what was it, Thursdays, the one where they did the, the quantum entanglement over 62 miles, whatever, where they, where, what they're doing is they're manipulating the electrons in one atom over here and then 62 miles across in, in, in a fiber, at the end of the fiber optic, another atom is moving in the exact same, basically, you know, doing this and then puppetizing over here the same atom. That's, that's very close to teleportation. That's very close to what we think of in, in fiction terms as teleportation, or telekinesis or mind control or whatever because you're affecting over a long distance things that shouldn't be connected. That's like, I mean, that that is, for those who are not really into science, that is tantamount to my saying, I'm gonna take a left turn with my Volvo and then in the next city, you suddenly, your Volvo suddenly turns left. So there's no reason for that, but there is what we call quantum entanglement, as you know. So it is the idea that something over here can affect something over here where there's no visible connection. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, you can find ways of, you see stuff like that, and then it's either a background element for a story where Tony mentions something about quantum entanglement and that lets you know that he's reading the same cool stuff that you are, or you make a plot point. Like I did something with the, the Justice League a few years ago, where I did a story that was, again, about quantum entanglement, but it was the idea that they, that somebody has broken the connection between atoms and in doing so they've affected the causal probability on a, on a global scale where things just th the improbable just starts happening the impossible just starts happening and it's happening on a bigger and bigger scale so i don't know i mean that's that it's just such a rich source of story material it, it is i'm glad you brought up the jla thing because I, I was reading that i'm like this this is just analogous to uh you know quantum entanglement yeah. this is brilliant i mean um, and another another really interesting thing about the quantum entanglement is that it uh, when you when we, we're not really sure uh, how these things how the electrons or particles entangle, uh, but they just stick them close to one another and eventually they entangle somehow, and then they separate them, and then when they uh, so electrons have a certain spin if you 
change the spin, it will change the spin over here, but that happens instantaneously. Um, so that's faster than the speed of light. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Um, Ramona Freedon, everybody. Um, so that's faster than the speed of light, and we don't, you know, that, that's uh, sort of beyond our comprehension of, of what we know that, that can be done. So just brave new worlds that need to be explored. Um, I, I'm just turning the, I'm turning everything over to her. So yeah. <laughs> that sounded pretty awesome what you were just saying. <laughs> Um, well, uh, well, everybody's here now. Um, so, um, <coughs> superheroes under a microscope. So we're just looking at superheroes uh, under you know a scientific lens to to see how uh, these things are possible or or just completely absurd um, either way. And um, of course, now you know all this um, things that we've done. But uh, so one of the me having a chemistry background, uh, things that, it, that, that just um, tickles me is uh, Ramona has uh, designed and created, co-created a character that is quintessentially chemistry walking around. Yeah. And uh, Mark has also written some stories about this character, his metamorpho. Um, I love this character, he's, he's, he's amazing and uh, if, if uh, share some stories about the character. Well, I certainly <clears throat> can't come at it from the scientific point of view, but um, I like Metamorpho especially because he was so hideous looking and yet he was a romantic hero. I thought that was quite a feat for the writer to pull off. And uh, I think it was George Cashtan who supplied all the uh, scientific uh, background for Metamorpho. And uh, Bob Haney just fleshed out the plot. So um, I think I'd do better if you just ask me some questions because I don't have any, you know, prepared stuff to tell you about this. Well, but the design, was the design 100% yours? Yeah, I think it was. It was a long time ago. We used to have uh, conferences when they first, uh, you know, invented the character. And I put him in uh, capes and masks and, you know, the usual superhero stuff. And somehow it didn't work. And then I think I finally figured out that since his body was always changing, you know, into different uh, compounds and things, that he shouldn't have any clothes on. So it <laughs> <laughs> would get in the way, you know. So we did. I just designed him with a, these his tights. And the odd thing is, he came out of that pyramid with a M on his belt. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about comics. <laughs> As luck would have it. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, we went from there. I designed the other characters, and, you know, the basic characters Simon Stagg and Sapphire and Java. And Java was inspired by my brother, who, <laughs> who used to beat me up when I was little. And so <laughs> I got back at him. <laughs> so, you know, this isn't very, as I said, not very scientific. But I did have some, I have met some fans who said they became chemical engineers inspired by Metamorpho. So that was nice. I felt good about that. Awesome. That's, that's a great, great story. Um, and uh, how, how was your writing the, the character? I, I love writing Metamorpho. I mean, he's so irreverent and he's, yeah. and, you know, and as Rex Mason, he was Indiana Jones before Indiana Jones was Indiana Jones. He was a fortune hunter. And that was that was cool, but I like the I like characters with, limit, with limitations. Even I like even superheroes with limitations to their powers because it makes the stories a lot more interesting. And what people generally keep forgetting about Metamorpho is he can't turn into any element. He can't just suddenly become plutonium because he can win every fight. If he do if he did that, he can't just become kryptonite if he, if he fights Superman. He's limited to, he's a Rubik's Cube of elements in the human body. He's limited only to, by the elements and compounds in the human body. That's, which is basically, as I understand it, like four, basically 14, 14 big elements. I was unaware of that, actually. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, not that it, it's not that he can transmute into anything. It's that it took, and it's there in the original stories, it just took the elements that are in his own body already and just scrambled them up. So he can only turn into things that can be found in the human body or compounds that can be created by the elements in the human body. Oh, I didn't know that. Look at that. <laughs> I have now school the co-creator and the, the chemistry teacher. <laughs> Since he was, it was fire, air, earth, and water, isn't it? Isn't that the, aren't those the, ancient, the ancient elements? Yeah. And of course, Metamorpho looks like he's made up of wood and metal and uh, water or something like that, and then some horrible skin disease. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what that represents. But that, you know, I never realized that it was limited to the human body. Yeah. I actually made a slide uh, based on trying to figure out what the four parts of Metamorpho were. I'm very interested. So, um, so uh, the, the orange part, um, there's not really anything that's solid uh, necessarily that would give off that color, but bromine gas is, has a little bit of that color. So if he could take all the bromine in his body, which I would assume would be very little, um, and condense it into into a solid, um, uh, you know, that could be the orange part. And um, his white head uh, could be phosphorus. There are different types of elemental phosphorus. Uh, so there's white phosphorus. And the purple um, on his left side could also be a different form of phosphorus. And how phosphorus changes its colors is it changes the bond lengths uh, between um, between and interacting with other phosphorus uh, atoms. I'm listening, but I'm looking stuff up as you talk, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then one of his legs, uh, you know, certainly looks like copper, so that's probably copper. And one of them looks like a metal, uh, you know, so it could be any of the, any of the metals, but I just said uh, possibly silver because that's where we get the, you know, it has a silver color. So, okay, here's your list. Okay? The, there are there are certain elements you you got. Oxygen is the greatest component of the human body. Right. I wrote this down from BC years ago. Uh, carbon is next. <coughs> Hydrogen at 10%. Nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and sodium. Magnesium. And then you get to the trace elements. You got about 0.7% of fungi, copper, zinc, selenium, molybdenum, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, manganese, cobalt, and iron, and then the super trace amounts that there's just little tiny bits of lithium, strontium, aluminum, silicon, lead, vanadium, arsenic, and bromine. And presumably even maybe some mercury if you had fillings. So, <laughs> so is that jive with what that jive with what you've got there? Um, yeah, I, uh, the, the phosphorus, if you know, if we can turn the uh, phosphorus that's in our body into elemental phosphorus, yeah. then certainly. Um, the bromine, you know, that's a, that's a far fetch that probably won't, won't, wouldn't happen. Um, copper, there's so little that it wouldn't be able to cover a whole leg, maybe one toe. Uh, well, let's, let's assume that because, for instance, you can turn into a cloud of bromine or something like that. Let's assume that even though it's, it, even though it's scrambled, it's not necessarily the, the, the relative amount still. Let's assume that there's enough flexibility to it where he can become an iron statue, even though obviously there's not enough iron to actually become in the human body to actually become a statue. So if that's the case, then it still then it still works, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, then that's, yeah that's better than that case. I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, but yeah, but I, gosh, I feel. No, no, no. This is this is this is, this is now asking where my keys are. I don't know that. <laughs> asking where my hotel room is. I don't know that, but I know this. So. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, another awesome character that uh, that Ramona has drawn and Mark has has written is Aquaman. Um, Ramona actually uh, co-created, right? Uh, no, Aqualab. Yeah, yeah, um, which is awesome. So there's some interesting uh, scientific points of there, but if you could share drawing uh, Yeah, I feel Aqualab. like such a dope. I mean, I've got this, you know, I don't know all this science stuff. No, you have been a solid contributor to this. I mean, if, if it weren't for you having the visions to put this 
you know, stuff in the pages. I that guess. Also, <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody cares I can rattle off a list off my iPhone. What they care about is what it looks like and how it made yeah, them feel. So that they really did a great job. It was, you came on to Aquaman in the, in the early 50s, I want to say, yeah, right? You've done um, Shining Night and a couple of other things at, yeah. at DC. Who was your editor? Yeah, mostly, well, in the beginning it was Murray Boltonoff, and then I worked with George Cashton for most of the time. Okay. And, uh, they, well, Aquaman, I, I hate to say, but I really didn't enjoy drawing Aquaman. <laughs> because I didn't like, I never liked drawing superheroes per se, because they, to me, they did, never had personalities. They weren't, you know, they weren't people that I could understand. They didn't interact with each other except to hit each, you know, to hit the smash and that kind of thing. And that's why I really enjoyed Metamorpho because those were characters that were interacting. I could recognize them and I could articulate them. And for me, it was a lot of fun. Classic Man too, in a different yeah. way. I like goofy. I always like the goofy strips. Yeah. So Aquaman was very straight. And at, when I was drawing it, we lived way out in the country in Connecticut, and there was no research available, and there were no iPads and that kind of thing. So I never did much research, and I think if you look at those fish closely that I drew, you'll see the lot of <laughs> <laughs> But the thing about fish is they're so varied, it doesn't matter, you know, they're so inventive. <clears throat> so, um, and I must say that while I was drawing Aquaman, I did kind of have a crush on him. He was such a nice, you know, clean-cut 50s kind of a guy. And I hated it when they put beard, a beard on him in a book and made him psychotic. <laughs> I think he's going back a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Back, At least you know? he's got his hand back. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. I don't know. I, I have to be asked questions. I really don't know what else to say about it. Drawing, uh, drawing is hard, you know, in case anybody's interested. It, it's, it's really a lot of hard work, to, especially for me, uh, laying out the, the layouts are hard. I like doing the figures a lot. But um, I, I really inspired and, and enjoy doing goofy characters. That's been my, you know, my my pleasure when I've been doing uh, comics and doing the mysteries because I could exaggerate, you know. I could never be serious about comics. I just couldn't take them seriously. And I couldn't, I never got into that kind of mythic uh, feeling, you know. I just couldn't sum that up when I drew. So, here I am. <laughs> How was, how was drawing, or no, I'm sorry, uh, writing? The writing, I remember, it was, it's hard. it was hard for me to find a voice for the character, but it, I don't know, I kind of hit upon it when we were doing Kingdom Come, this idea that he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder a little bit because he, all the rest of the world has all the other superheroes, and he, only he has the oceans, and that's set, there's 70% of the world is that, and it's only, he's only got one guy to control that, so, um, but he's, he really, Michael Ringo, this artist that I adore, who I work with on Fantastic Four, we did a proposal for an Aquaman relaunch a few years ago, and it's, it's one of my favorite things we ever did, and it never got anywhere, because it came, we did it at a time when nobody wanted anything but grim and ugly and dark and cool heroes. I just thought, that's not what I want Aquaman to be. Aquaman is, like, the ocean is people, is a lot of people's sort of peaceful place, right? It's, it's the, you know, when you talk about going to your happy place and kind of relaxing. You're meant, you know, a lot of people think about being on the beach and there's the crash of the waves and stuff. And I wanted, and the ocean's mysterious too. So Mike had done up some beautiful sketches and our take on him was just that he was a mysterious man of the depths, but always had a smile on his face. And he didn't say much because he didn't have to. It's not like we can have a lot of conversations underwater. But <laughs> he just, he did his thing. And we told it from the point of view of a Russian oceanographer who was, who became a love interest, but at first it was just, you know, he was, everybody knows the Justice League, but still if you're a Russian oceanographer, you don't have any connection to these characters, it's like you see them saving your city all the time. So it's, it was kind of a myth to her, and sort of watching her get into his world and, and 
and see a mantis and see, see the underworld. Again, think about the power of that. Anybody who, anybody who thinks that Aquaman is goofy or silly or dopey or ineffective, go to SeaWorld sometime. And, just, and, and I don't see people walk around SeaWorld going, well, this is stupid. No, it's a, I mean, it's a cool place, but that's a whole different story. I'm just saying, <laughs> but, but, or, the, or the Baltimore Aquarium across the harbor. I mean, you go there because it's magnificent, because the creatures are amazing, because the ocean has such depth and mystery and power to it, and that's really cool. There's nothing, you know, people watch Shark Week like it was the Super Bowl. <laughs> so don't tell me that Aquaman's dope. You know, Aquaman's part of that world. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's wild that, that, you know, we've been to the moon, but we haven't even explored uh, no. a, a, not even close to a large part of our ocean. Right. It's, it's, it's wild to me. Yeah. Um, so, like, so some of the, some of the science behind uh, Aquaman, like, how can, uh, so we, we, we look at Aquaman and a lot of people think he's, he's a little dopey and then you know, we see Superman, but our, our concept of why Superman is so tough is, is Krypton and, and part of that explanation is well Krypton's density or uh, gravitational pull was so much greater, so his bones and stuff are, are uh, adapt to that. But if you're living at the bottom of the sea, absolutely, that is going to be, um, your, your body will, would, it would be about the equivalent of living on Krypton as far as the gravitational pull on you and all this pressure. So Aquaman should, is as tough as Superman, um, just looking at the science in terms of uh, gravitational pull. Yeah, wouldn't you think he'd explode when he came up? <laughs> 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 That happens, doesn't it? Um, yeah, well, with the lungs, if you, if you don't have the, the lung pressure regulated well enough, yeah, you can... Uh, that way. This is fascinating because I stopped doing Aquaman back in 1960, and nobody ever thought to flesh him out as a character. It just never occurred to anybody who was writing that. These things were done for kids, yeah. and it was just for the story, nothing else, no character at all. And it's, it's really interesting to me to listen to writers talk and because they're constantly investigating and adding, you know, uh, uh, and it's, it reminds me of like a Greek drama, you know, they had these wonderful distant gods and then Euripides came along and began to psychoanalyze them in a sense, you know, give them personalities and the same process seems to be going on here with the writers. Yeah, I, mean, I, think you, I think it can be taken too far if it becomes if you're really trying to dissect the characters deeply in terms of their science and so forth and so on, that's fun to do, but, the, but ultimately they can fly. Ultimately there's, that, there, there's a sense of wonder, there's a, there's a sort of a, a, what's the word I'm looking for, the, the, the suspension of disbelief that has to go with the characters. But, but I think that, I mean speaking for myself, that's the fun of working with the character, just as, just as for, the, for you the fun of it is capturing that look or capturing that expression that you're trying to get, or you know, or the fact you have a crush on Aquaman, when you're, you know, the the idea that that's the fun of it to you, and for somebody like me, the fun of it is thinking about things like, all right, he he lives underwater, so when yeah. he speaks above the water, he speaks in the air, you can't hear him. He mutters because sound travels so much better underwater. He wouldn't he. The voice he his his indoor voice, you know, the voice he uses underwater will carry much further. But when he's above the water in the air, he's speaking like he normally would. But everybody's constantly going, "I'm, I'm sorry, what what was that?" <laughs> Just little things like that are the fun to me of 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 thinking about these characters on a, on a sort of scientific level. Yeah. Well, see, to show you how little we thought of that back then. Remember they used to, Superman used to fly through the air and his hair never got mussed? I know, I know. I know. You never bothered no. No. anything real at all. Um, well, uh, talking about messing up hair, uh, you know, how can Aquaman go so fast? Like, you know, he can, he can swim extraordinarily fast. Um, I don't think they must his hair up either. No. Uh, um, but if you if you look at if, it, if you look at dolphins, uh, one of the reasons that they can swim so fast is they actually shed their skin at an incredible rate, yes. and that um, sort of breaks up some of the uh, vertices that would uh, slow them down. Sorry, I have to Somebody apparently left a portfolio here for a second. Down there. Thank you.
No, nope, that's not the one we're looking for. Good news. Good news, Wheezy, we found your portfolio. There we go. Excellent. She gets a friend. Go away. <laughs> you had your panel. Go away. <laughs> Um, so that's how. So that's how. You know, that's how dolphins travel. But you said it's a shedding of. Yeah, they they uh, they you know they basically have extreme dander. Yeah. And <laughs> um, and that helps break up some of uh, some of the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for the, the vortex from from the the force of the water that's cool. hitting them. Um, and one of uh, something that was very fun in, in reading uh, one of your JLA stories, you had. Uh, the flash and uh, well, the whole jelly really, but the panel showed flash and um, the plastic man going down into water and being like, "Okay, oh, breathe. What, what are we doing here?" Um, so it, it's just, and I thought this was a really interesting that uh, you you have Aquaman in, in his world and you bring the other Justice League people there and they can't function normally. No, no, they can't. I mean, this is, you know, it's not only is it. A world where the pressure is so insane that it would again, it would crumple a battleship if it were that deep. But your your entire sense of balance is thrown off because there's no we we automatically tune to the sun and the sky. Even on a cloudy day, are we take we and birds and all above above land creatures take our cues from that in terms of where we are. So if you're that deep underwater, you're you know which way is up, which way is down. You you get you know, that you get discombobulated by that. Atlantis is not much help because Atlantis, there's no stairs in Atlantis. There's no, like, doorways. And why would there be? They can swim. <laughs> they can swim. There shouldn't be any roads either. There shouldn't be any roads either. Exactly. Why, exactly. why would you? I know. Um, so not. You're, you're ruining art. <laughs> 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 I know <laughs> this. I ruined it. So I drew a picture recently of um, Aquaman's out in the desert, and of course, that's not his, you know, his media. And uh, he's with Metamorpho, so Metamorpho turned his arm into a shower, and he showered. Oh, that's down great! And <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so that's my, you know, my tribute to reality. <laughs> Um, well, uh, to jump from Aquaman to another character, sure. The Flash. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll open up again, Roberto. Uh, your experience with drawing Flash, and then your experience with Flash. I didn't do Flash. Well, you drew some little bit. The, 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 the Super Friends. Friend. Super Friends. You draw them a couple times, but not at great length. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with you know, with Flash, remember that suspension of disbelief I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's. There's, there's rules to running, and there's rules to energy conservation. You can't possibly put out that much energy. And you would, I, you know, I did the research. You'd have to eat something like, like 1,300 pizza pies a day <laughs> just to be able to do the basic stuff that Flash does because of the caloric input and how much energy you're putting out. So I know that, you know, it's kind of fun to have Flash eat a lot because he uses a lot of energy, but there's no way to account for that. So, <laughs> so we built, basically what we built was something that, because I never came up with a better name for it, and I wish I had, something called the Speed Force, <laughs> which, is, which, which is one of those names that comes to you because the FedEx guy is standing on your front porch <laughs> saying, I need the script. Um, and the Speed Force is, is that thing that I basically said is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of an energy construct that exists beyond the speed of light. Again, and this is not science at all. This is making make this up. up. And it is, it is something from which all the speechers draw their energy. So that accounts for the fact that they, they have friction-proof auras that keep them from burning up as they travel through the air. And it accounts for the reason that they don't fly off into space the moment they hit seven miles a second, which is escape velocity, um, and, and allows them to, to do their super speed stunts. Um, I mean, yes, as, as, you know, a science person, I look at the speed force, I'm like, how can I yeah. even try to no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's, you know, how can Superman pick up a, a building by the corner? 
you can't, you kind of just like, just roll your eyes and go, all right, sign comics, everybody. <laughs> you have to just believe. Exactly. Like, Suspension of disbelief, believe. exactly. Verisimilitude. I yeah. remember, I don't, I don't remember, but I've read that when Superman first came out, uh, they tried to explain to the audience how he got his superpowers and they compared him to the distance a beetle or something can jump you yeah, know, off, times yeah. its Rest body off, yeah. and yeah. Grass yeah. Off, or was it wasn't yeah. But, the, but at the same time, when he first came in, this is true, when they first came out, the publisher, who was I, Harry Donenfeld, I guess at the time, looked at that first cover of Superman smashing a car across, yeah, suspension of disbelief. Um, and another, uh, um, in, in, in that image with the grasshopper, they also linked it to uh, uh, an ant being able to lift uh, oh, yeah, 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 its, yeah. its, yeah. its weight. But that's so limiting. Superman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. From what he turned into, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's very, very limited. I mean, in a sense, you're limiting the powers of these characters by trying to explain them. Yeah, the that's true. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Again, at the, at the end of the day, nobody cares. Nobody cares <laughs> whether, you know, again, like it's my favorite example is always Superman lifting a stadium with one hand or whatever, and it doesn't collapse under its own weight. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> no, I don't care. What I care about is Superman can fly through the air. That's the part of Superman that, that we all identify. You ask any 10 people at random on the street, tell me something about Superman, they'll tell you he can fly. Yeah. And that's the coolest thing about Superman, and all the other stuff is just window dressing. It's fun to play with the science of it and stuff, yeah. and it's fun to have those. But at the end of the day, that's what's that's what counts. Right. Yeah. But also these, these fantastical characters um, help help you know science envision what could be possible. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. so, you know, uh, a great example of that is of course is Star Trek. You know, we have cell phones, that was their communication device in Star Trek. Right. You know, that's uh, a direct link there. So um, we're, we're we're coming up to tricorders, we're coming up to medical scanning devices that are able to tell you stuff. Yeah. Right. And already they you know they, we have machines that can sniff out cancer just as the, using the, the same sort of uh, genomes that dogs use. Because a lot of a lot of people have like diabetics. Dolphins too. Dolphins too, exactly. Diabetics have rescue dogs that are specifically trained to sniff out when body when your body sugar goes up and down and stuff. So that's so worked very close and we can regulate that now in machine form. Right. Um, and, and another thing is uh, you know, we have uh, three three uh, D printers. Yes, and replicators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, pretty soon we can just uh, make an orange from a yeah. 3D printer and eat it. Yeah. It'll, well, not pretty soon, but, you know. So I, I would be willing to assume that, I would be willing to that we'll all still be alive in this room when, when we can create food yeah. with, with machines. Real food? Real yeah. food, yeah. <laughs> We're very close now. People are creating body parts. People are creating organic things, you know, like, like and again, it's in the, the next step will be organs. The next step will be creating kidneys, creating, you know, uh, the, the kidneys will probably be the next thing. Right. Um, we would be able to create through machine and to allow people to, to function. So food is the next step up. Yeah. Right. Because um, once I have a machine that makes Skittles, nobody's going <laughs> to have to leave the house again. <laughs> exactly. yeah. you, just, you just have to get a, a refill of all the uh, elements there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so with, with that link into science, um, I want to uh, you know, share, uh, Ramona contributed a cover to uh, Dignifying Science, which was written by uh, Jim Ottaviani, um, which is uh, an awesome, awesome book. Um, what, did, uh, what did you think about doing the cover for that and, and the book itself? It was a long time ago. <laughs> I'm really not the person to be on this panel. <laughs> I don't remember very much. I remember doing that cover and then struggling with Hedy Lamar's face. I mean, See, for that's me, a, that's a good story. There you go. Drawing is a struggle. Yeah. You know, it's just, um, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was doing. I know I had to have some flowers. I, these are just snatchy memories, yeah. memories that I have of doing that cover. But I know that he was a very serious guy and was doing some really interesting books. And uh, he did he did an Oz book, didn't he? And fairy tales, or was it was it the Wizard of Oz? I think so. I think he did. Yeah, he did. He did some really interesting things. And but I, I'm afraid I can't contribute anything very uh, helpful to this. I just don't remember well doing that cover. Is everybody enjoying having Ramona on the yeah. panel? <laughs> Is 
So knock it off. <laughs> You're doing great. Drawers are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, thank you for <coughs> you know, drawing that cover and, and contributing to, you know, uh, well, this book, this book specifically, which was, you know, contributing um, women in science. There are those stories of women in science, which was fantastic and not talked about enough. Right. Um, and there, there's a one, uh, another big superhero of mine, the independent character that that you wrote one issue of. Um, that uh, sort of blows my mind in terms of his powers, and that is Doctor Solar. Ah, Doctor Solar. That the, the God Machine. That guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I mean, and I only tinkered a little bit. What was What was your experience with this? When did you discover the character? I discovered the character probably about five years ago. I wrote or I read uh, Jim Shooter's uh, Dark Horse Run first, and it just it it. Uh, really captured my imagination in mixing science and comics. I'm like, this guy can do anything. You know, it's it's you know directly related to just you know uh, subatomic particles and, and just being able to manip manipulate them. Actually, beyond that, because he is basically e, m e equals m c squared. He can turn his energy into mass and mass into energy. So it's just fantastic. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, so. Uh, I got nothing. I got okay. <laughs> what do you think of Kirby? What, I mean, do you think that his stuff is is uh, based on science, or, or you know, an interest in science, or an interest in tantra? I mean, it seems to me that the uh, the kind of transformation that his characters go through have something to do with the process of tantric yoga. Uh, they start out being zapped by something, yeah. which in tantra would be the passion of love, you know, or, or an alchemy would be the heat of fire, you know, and those two things sort of work together. And it seems to me that all of these superheroes gain, most of them now gain their powers through some part, sort of accident or some kind of radiation, yeah. you know, explosion that then transforms them and gives them these superpowers. So it's not a scientific thing per se, it's more of a, a I guess you'd say Tantra is a spiritual practice, you know, very, very, just, you know, rigid discipline. And uh, I just wonder what you think about that. I, I actually never thought about it in those terms. I just strictly thought about it in, in okay, he took something that, that uh, he did, he made a story that, okay, how can I look, through, look at this through the lens of science? I never thought about looking at it through the lens of all these energy human. things yeah. going around, you know, in the air all the time. I mean, I think he's very tuned Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Every panel was just very yeah. energetic. Yeah. yeah, I think again didn't didn't care about the the reality of the science as much as just the feeling. And it yeah. was so so much of his stuff was even though it was all about energy and radiation and, and so forth, it was still about energy. It was still about human yeah. human, human passions and human emotions and stuff. So that's a very that's a really good observation. And it's interesting because in Tantra the, the theory is that once they have achieved the you know the breakthrough, they have superpowers. They can teleport, they can uh, fly. I mean it's it's very, very similar and it, it might be interesting for some of you to, you know, investigate that. But I think uh, who's the um, who does the Promethea books? That's oh, yeah. Tantra per se. Yeah, Alan know? Moore and yeah, J.G. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I think, I mean, how else? I just, I don't think science as such can explain superpowers. No. And I think it's fantasy, either fantasy or it's some product of mind. You know? yeah, yeah. So. So in uh, with the Tantra, is it that they just reach a certain? Point in their practice and in their mind that it just releases these yeah, powers. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's a complicated physical, uh, mental process. Both it takes years of discipline, and nobody really has ever seen a yoga fly, and yet there's been so many convincing, like shamans, the right. same thing as shamanism. They're very yeah. close, you know. So I think I always think of this as a form of shamanism. If uh, but for kids, they don't care. It just happens. It's fine, you know. And basically, that's what comics are for, kids. Yes. <laughs> you people shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, well, there's there's like 15 minutes left, so maybe we should open it up to questions to the crowd. You guys have questions have question. for Miss yeah. Ramona? Did your brother ever figure out you were writing about him? He's dead. Long you know, he died before I did Java. Ah. No, I would have told him though. <laughs> Yes, sir. What was the best use of science in a, a comic book story or battle that you ever wrote, wrote, wrote written, written One, or seen? Or seen? That's a really good question. Um, you did the shield. I do shield. The, but you know, all right, no, but my answer is the Metal Men. The answer is the creation of the Metal Men. The Metal Men, for those who don't know, it was a weekend assignment. It was a, it, suddenly there was a hole in the schedule at DC Comics in 1963. And the, the writer slash editor Robert Kaniger, who was a character in uh, his own right, um, he had a week. He and his artists had a weekend and a couple of days to come up with a brand new, a brand new character, a brand new something from scratch. Didn't care what. Kaniger grabbed the chemistry textbook from his desk, and he came up with this concept of six robots, each of them made from a different element, and each of them their personality sort of informed by that. Mercury was the hot head because you find workers in thermometers. Obviously, iron was sort of the, the stalwart, you know, sort of humble go-to, you know, solid every man in the team, and so forth and so on. And I learned so much about science from reading those comics because it, it was, yes, it was fantasy, but still, the care, the, 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 each, each robot's abilities were very, very in tune with what those elements could do, and they were confined by what Gold, gold was incredibly ductile and it spread itself very thin. So that was the element we used in the stories, or you know, things like that. That that I thought was the best use of science I've ever seen because it was very grounded in science. It was a really perfect blend of of fantasy, so you didn't feel like the science was just too much like you'd be in school, and at the same time, the science was was very grounded, very real. It has to do with uh, Dr. Solo. Is he similar to Dr. Manhattan, or are they like different? He was a spin-off. Uh, what was he? Or think, Dr. Solar. Doc, Dr. Solar uh, was the original character. Uh, no, it was your gold. Thinking, no, you're thinking of uh, Captain Adam. Was actually the original the inspiration for Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, but no, no, no. no. <laughs> but, uh, but Dr. Solar, I, I, I need to hijack the panel. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Solar actually came first. Okay. Uh, but in the in the in the original comics, he was just another scientist hit with radiation, and okay. he could just kind of do whatever this, the plotter needed him to do. It was only after Doctor Manhattan Doctor Manhattan hit with Watchmen and stuff that the writers uh, who rebooted and, and rethought Doctor Solar thought, "Ooh, there's some mileage in here." <laughs> Doc, you know, Doctor Manhattan lasted for 12 issues, and that universe went away. Right. What can we do to sort of do more stories along those lines? Yes, sir. Um, you talked about the characters you did like writing the science for. Yes. Is there anyone that either guest started one of your comics or you just had no idea what to do with or you just hated it when they appeared? And the science in particular. I'm trying to think. What, who, who makes my head melt when it comes to science? Because the part, because the fun part is always taking the characters that even the ones that don't seem to make any sense on the surface of them and try to find something. It was never the science characters that bothered me. I could always logic the science. It was always characters like Thor and Wonder Woman, who I like as characters, but I can't wrap my head around those characters to save my life because it's all fantasy. It's all they can do anything. They can. There's no. There's no real. Yeah. There's no exact. There's no real sort of scientific limits to their powers, and I don't know. I can't. I. I never. This is why you see very few Thor or Wonder Woman guest appearances in my comics. So. Yeah, I mean they're they're gods basically. So yeah. how how can you, you know that that the premise of that in itself is is opposite of science. Yeah. So it, it's hard to yeah. to work with. There's a powerful core there. Yeah. Yeah, there there really is. I just, and again, I would never in any way disparage or diminish those characters. It's just saying not to my taste. So yes, sir. I was gonna say, what hero is compelling you think could be like closest to reality? Aside from like, you know, Flash or Bruce Wayne that got tech toys and everything like that, but any superhero, supervillain with an actual power, who would be closest to the 
Like who's the closest to like who's, who in the next hundred years can we conceivably see? Pace Pump. Pace Pump. Iron Man? I mean, that's, you know, Elon Musk is Tony Stark, first off. <laughs> that's what I said, those, those folks aside. Exactly. Yeah, those aside. Tech toys, so. Yeah, so we're talking about like people. With, that's a very good question. What, do we, what, what have we seen in terms of biological advancements recently that... I, I mean, people have yeah. appendages you know, that are electronic that work. Uh, I'm trying to think of... Cyborg is a good example. Does that count? Cyborg, that's one. Yeah. That's one, yeah. That's, I, I went someplace happy, you went someplace dark. <laughs> <laughs> What scientific character in the comic books that you bestly, that you relate to, that you see yourself as? If you had to say, yeah, that's me. Oh, that's a good question. Again, as ridiculous as it sounds, The Flash, because I can't do any of that stuff, but I'm impatient and I want to get my homework done instantly and I want to I want to experience all the life, and I'm constantly, I constantly feel, I, I wrote a line of Flash earlier where, like early on, the exact line, it was, time is the enemy of all living things. And that's how I feel a lot of times, like that time is my enemy, like I just want to explore things, I want to travel more, I want to meet more people, not you, but, <laughs> um, I want to, I want to get out and, and experience all the world has, and every, the old, sadly, I don't mean to get, drag the room down, but the older you get, the more you sort of hear the ticking of the clock and like I'm running out of time to do this stuff. So that's no, uh, Aries, actually. Yeah. Um, what about you? Is there, are there any superheroes you ever fantasized about being besides? Sapphire. Sapphire? <laughs> yeah, Sapphire. There you go. I don't know. No, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Have you ever had to try to explain to kids or to the audience about how the uh, the science works with some of the superhero outfits. Why they're almost still there at the end. <laughs> that oddly enough, people's clothes still stay the same. Um, I'm trying to think. We 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 did to some degree with Fantastic Four. I, I think it was Jack Kirby and Stanley who came up with the idea of unstable molecules, which is a perfect sort of whimsical suspension of disbelief blanket term for any clothes that you want to stay the same. Yes. Yeah. Uh, your shirt, you, you, you burst into flame, but your shirt's still there. Unstable molecule. <laughs> you shrank to a microscopic size, but your, your clothes still fit. Unstable molecule. <laughs> As a footnote to that, yes. Again, going back to I, I had the Marvel had the Marvel universe. Yeah. And even back into the '70s when I was a kid, someone asked the question, "How does the Hulk's pants stay on?" Yeah, <laughs> and they figured they, they in the in the universe yeah. the gamma radiation made the purple pants unstable molecules. <laughs> sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Otherwise, you know, he would do re-entry after battling the leader, and he'd be naked. And the right, it goes wouldn't happen. Although again, we that we're in that weird tightrope between I, I want to know and I just want to suspend my disbelief. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah, time for like one or two more. If you got anything, yes, sir. In terms of both writing and drawing, uh, how do you guys handle like a really mismatched scale of power? Like Superman and Spider-Man, everyone wants them to team up because they're Marvel and DC's flagship, but I always thought it's kind of pointless because <coughs> Superman lifts buildings and Spider-Man, you know, can lift a car. It just seems weird. How, how do you guys reconcile that? Were you ever called upon to do a story where you just had mismatched characters in terms of like their power levels or their or the villains they fought or ridiculously powered on power. I mean, did you? you fake it. You fake it. There you go. You fake it. There you go. No, seriously. Sometimes you just have to because it's so impossible, or the action itself is so impossible that you just have to find a way. They're doing it in movies all the time. I don't know if you notice it, but with special effects, you don't really see what's happening, but suddenly, you know, something is. Somebody's been hit and is knocked unconscious. Right. You don't know how it happened because the person was tied up before, I mean, you know, you just sort of, it's a sleight of hand kind of thing. That's, that's the only way I can explain it. You have to learn to do that. I think that says gobs, yes. <laughs> um, one, well, two more real quick, right? Yeah, we're yeah. Go out, so, because I want, the next panel's coming in, we just don't want to be rude to them. In the movie, Captain America's shield supposedly, I don't know, 
Yeah. How does it bounce? <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. He was talking about how how it, how if Captain America's shield is so resilient, how does it bounce? It's not made of vibranium. That's the mistake they keep saying in the in the movie. Yeah, that they picked up from the comics. It is not made of vibranium. If it were made of vibranium, then it, actually that's no, not true. It is it is partly vibranium. It's it's, it's not adamantium. They keep right. saying. Yeah, they, they, the comic. We can talk later. <laughs> It's partly it's partly vibranium and part partly a metal. They it's never different did. in the movies than in the comics. Yeah, in the comics, yeah. in any in, in, in yeah. adamantium in the, in the comics, or yeah. in the movies rather. Um, but talk about talk about resistance. Talk about res resilience. Like again, the same reason uh, the same reason a, a bowling ball will still bounce if you draw it from a high on a high enough. Yeah. So um, vibranium, the metal itself, can resist uh, the the force of vibrations. So. Um, I, you know, if, if it's in Captain America's hand, then they hit it, it'll resist a lot of that force and it could just, it'll just stay there. But if he's throwing it, of course it's going to, it, it will be able to have some force react on it, but not uh, to the extent that something normal, I guess. So you have to, suspension, uh, comics. Yeah. It's comics. <laughs> there was so one more. Yeah. Actually, there, um, I think we only got time for one more. You, you, so you look across the comic book universe and you start seeing a lot of characters that are very similar. You know, DC, Marvel, a lot of it. This character's really like, this could be that character. Hawkeye, yeah. Green Arrow, whatever. Yeah. And you know, we talk about possibilities of science, possibilities of what we can do with our imagination. At what point do you reach the point of that is so ridiculous that no one is going to buy it and they can do it anyway? Or if you ever reach that point and then said, no, nah, I can't go anywhere. Ghost Rider. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost Rider. Who, who a level flaming skull? Yeah, that is, that is tough. I, I have I can't think of concrete examples at the moment. I apologize, but I know there are times when I have read something in a scientific journal and I like cutting edge stuff, and I thought to myself, that would be really cool to put in a comic. But if I did it at this stage, no one would believe me. And in fact, when I wrote the one I, was, I let off talking about with the quantum entanglement with Justice League, I actually wrote an essay in the back of the comic, in the letters page, so that people wouldn't think I was making stuff out about a whole cloth and it was ridiculous. I wrote an essay on the reality of it. So. I don't get this because you believe that they can fly. <laughs> right. <laughs> they can live underwater. They can, Which, yeah. I mean, where, where does. I don't understand how you get all tangled up in science. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's just suspension. It's, oh, yeah. it's just a science person that wants to, to rationalize. You know, come up with an explanation of everything. Well, because sometimes you, you get a good story out. Sometimes in thinking about, like I said, the thing with Aquaman where he would, you know, above ground, he would his voice would sound like a whisper. At least I got a fun story element out of it. It didn't feel like I was breaking the suspension of disbelief. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, you're right. If you put all that stuff under a microscope, if you start pulling on that thread on that tapestry, the whole tapestry falls apart. Um, if we could give these people a hand. Uh, I want to thank them by giving them a gift as uh, Feynman by Jim Ottaviani. So some science uh, in, in comics. So um, one of those is for you. Thank you. I, don't, I do not have this. I've been looking for this. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very awesome. So, thanks everybody. Uh, Ramona, where you'll be on the, you'll be.